It also happens to be very propitious that today is uh, International Women's Day uh, because you're about to discover that one of the Glasgow Four is Margaret MacDonald Macintosh and she played a vital part in the evolution of the Glasgow style. But uh, history cuts her out as so often happens with women and she's only really been reinstated as a, a major figure in Macintosh's life really in the last 20 years. Uh, so if you want to ask me anything about recent books, please do feel free at to the end. So there are their birth and death dates. So Macintosh, as you can see, uh, was no, no real age, not by our standards, when he died. He was only, in his, only, he was only 60. And Margaret was a little older than him when they married, but she didn't outlive him uh, by very long. This is obviously a, a very sad tale in terms of Macintosh's reputation. Because when he died, the, uh, when she died, I should say, the total contents of the flat that they lived in uh, was valued at £80. And that included all of his watercolours uh, from Warberswick, his watercolours that he painted at Port Vendre in the south of France, and of course, those famous iconic chairs. So the whole lot only valued at £80. This is just to remind you that Macintosh's reputation was stratospheric in his own lifetime, completely fell into obs obscurity, and then his reputation was really only revived in the 1950s by Professor Howarth, and as far as the general public really, only revived when Glasgow was made cultural city, European cultural city, at the end of the 1990s. Okay, uh, so what was Glasgow like on the eve of the 20th century? Well, it was dirty, but it was also very rich. So just to remind you that there's a lot of rivalry between Edinburgh, uh, Athens of the north. Uh, we've got a lovely view from Carlton Hill out over Edinburgh. And it was, of course, home to all the major institutions, the National Gallery and the Academy. And there, by comparison, is uh, Glasgow, uh, the Clyde, shipbuilding, dirty, uh, polluted. Think of those white rooms, uh, but also very rich. But the money was important because it meant that there were lots of patrons in Glasgow. And as was the, the general case in the 19th century, if you made money, you wanted to put it into art. Um, it was partly status, but it was also this idea uh, that you could move through the higher echelons of society if one became involved with the arts. Glasgow was desperate to put itself on the cultural, cultural map. Uh, com you know, comparing itself to Edinburgh. And it held a big international exhibition in uh, Glasgow at the end of the 1880s. So you might think that this is a painting of Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. It does look very similar in, in the heart of Glasgow. But in fact, it's one of the temporary buildings created for the International Glasgow Exhibition. It's by Sir John Lavery, and you might think it should really be by James McNeill Whistler. Lavery was very influenced by Whistler at this point in his career. But Lavery was one of the Glasgow boys who had been working tirelessly, really, uh, throughout the 1880s to put Glasgow onto the artistic scene. So uh, reminding ourselves that Macintosh is technically part of the Art Nouveau movement, uh, these two images obviously are rather shocking. On the left-hand side, we have the first Art Nouveau building, well, often said to be the first Art Nouveau building in the world. This is the L'Hôtel Tassel in Brussels, and it dates to 1893. And as you can see, it's a riot of curvilinear ornamentation. A lot of people will tell you that Macintosh didn't like Art Nouveau. And by that, they are referring to the uh, brand of Art Nouveau that we associate very much with Horta in Brussels and Hector Guimard in Paris. He found it too overly decorated. His own brand of Art Nouveau was very different and was informed on the one hand by his love of all things Japanese and also, of course, by the English arts and crafts movement. So it may come as a shock to you to realise that these two extremes of Horta in Brussels and Macintosh in Glasgow are both defined as being part of the Art Nouveau movement. A vital element within Art Nouveau was the idea that the architect was now in charge of the entire environment. This is known as a Gesamtkunstwerk, a very complicated German word, uh, which basically means that a home was now a total art work. So Madame van der Velde, who you see here, has been beautifully attired 
to match the interior created by her own husband, Henri van der Velde, who was also one of the major figures in the Art Nouveau movement um, in Belgium. So she's been coordinated to match the two prints on the wall. In fact, they're two watercolours on the wall uh, by her artistic husband. The problem now is she's rather trapped in a gilded cage. Um, she harmonises beautifully with her drawing room, but might well be a discord if she tries to move anywhere else. The important thing is that you can really see Madame van der Velde as a bit of a victim in the sense that she's wearing a dress designed by her husband to match his interiors. The same cannot be said of Margaret Macdonald Mackintosh. She married Mac uh, Mackintosh in 1900. So we see her here, sat in front of that cabinet, uh, which was to be found in their main street flat in Glasgow. Margaret was very much a new woman. Uh, you see her here in a dress that she designed and made herself. And the panels on the cabinet behind her were also designed and made by her as she had a thorough artistic training at the Glasgow School of Art. So you don't need to see her as a victim of the high art movement. She was very much, she very much had agency in terms of her lifestyle and also in terms of her dress and the interior decor that she and Mackintosh created first in their flat and then in their home in Hill's Head. So I've already mentioned that the aesthetic that we need to think about in terms of Macintosh's style is not the curvy linear ornamentation that we saw uh, courtesy of water in Brussels, but his love of all things Japanese. His cabinets, like the famous one that you see here designed for the Hill House and recently recovered by the way, uh, bought uh, with uh, money from the National Trust and the Art Fund. So you're seeing it in situ um, in Hill House, which is in Helensborough. And it's sort of shared between there and the main gallery in Kel at Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. So you can see that it looks rather like a woman in a kimono with her arms outstretched. So for obvious reasons, they are often referred to as kimono cabinets. In this instance, the decorative panel in the centre is attributed to Macintosh, but it was often Margaret that supplied the decorative elements on these rather stark uh, geometric ca cabinets. He preferred black and white, so although you can't see me, my blouse is black and white, but you can see a checkerboard pattern here of mother of pearl running round uh, the opened doors, and the square of the grid will be part of Macintosh's signature. In fact, it's the signature of the Glasgow Four. There were four in the group, so they were bound to take a square as their logo. This is just to remind you that throughout the 19th century, there'd been a huge interest in what is known as Japanism, ever since Japan was opened up to the West in the early 1850s. This is actually Madame Monet, painted by her husband, Claude Monet, in the mid 1870s. And the most obvious Japanese element here are the paper fans in the background. It's rather like an algorithm uh, going through the 19th century with another sort of peak in the 1890s. If you know a little bit about Aubrey Beardsley, you'll know that he was very much influenced by the Japanese prints. This kimono cabinet is by E.W. Godwin. It's in the V&A, and we believe that it was designed as early as the late 1860s, but it was put into production in 1877. It doesn't use expensive materials. It has nothing to do with the English arts and crafts movement in terms of production, and it could be made uh, through any, it was made through a, a standard uh, cabinet maker. But most importantly, you can see again, it's this theme of the kimono cabinet. And this whole movement is known as the Anglo-Japanese movement, or in this case, Anglo-Japanese furniture. In Glasgow, there was a particular interest in all things Japanese, because believe it or not, they were building the Japanese fleet on the Clyde. I mentioned the Glasgow Boys, there were many of them, Lavery was only one, but two other members of the Glasgow Boys went to Japan. They went to Tokyo in 1893. This is Atkinson Hornell and uh, uh, Henry. So the uh, portrait at the top is by Atkinson Hornell, and he was painting in a style that I think you'll agree uh, was rather like uh, Vincent van Gogh has gone to Japan. And then George Henry, who's down the bottom, his Japanese lady with a fan. And it always looks to me like the fan has become something akin uh, to a painter's palette. And when Henry and Hornell returned from Japan in the mid 1890s, 
their works were displayed in uh, Glasgow, in one of the most prestigious commercial art galleries there. And so it wasn't difficult for Macintosh to find out about Japanese prints or the impact of Japanese prints on contemporary uh, Glaswegian art. So that perhaps helps to explain the cool, minimalist character of his interiors. More straight lines than curved lines, and definitely the Japanese ethos, that less is more. Over the mantelpiece here is a wonderful Jesu or Gesu uh, panel by Margaret. So you can see that Margaret's decoration played an integral part in Macintosh's design ethos. He also liked to completely, you know, um, mix and match black and white. So we've got black furniture in a white interior. And remember how dirty Glasgow was at the end of the 19th century. It's just as well that he was able to deal with electric lights rather than gas. Macintosh's style evolves very quickly, considering that his career really only spans some 20 years from the eight, late 1890s, the famous Glasgow School of Art was conceived in 1897, to when he left Glasgow on the eve of the First World War. He moves from very overt, organic, rather Art Nouveau, uh, floriate forms, seen here in a domino table, uh, designed for one of Miss Cranston's tea rooms. And the idea was that you, you hid your dominoes and then you brought them out to play them on the top. And that dates to 1898, it was for Argyle Street. But we can compare it to the one from Ingram, for Ingram Street, which was some 10 years later in date. And you can see that all the curves have disappeared to become very rigorously geometric. It's got a, a circle on the top and then four squares underneath. And the four squares definitely becomes the Glasgow 4 logo. You'll meet the Glasgow 4, all of them, in just a minute. Macintosh was very well read. He knew all about the English arts and crafts movement. And uh, William Letherby, who was the author of Architecture, Mysticism and Myth, well, this was a book that was very well known to the young Macintosh. We actually know that he paraphrased it for a lecture in 1893. So he was very familiar with progressive elements in British architecture. But perhaps what may surprise you is that Macintosh was very keen to make his buildings meaningful in terms not only of their decoration, but even their forms. Because Letherby practiced the idea of symbolic architectural forms. Hence, on the frontispiece to his book, we have the circle and the square. The circle always represents spirit, as in a halo. The square always represents earth, as in four square. And then the image uh, in the middle, uh, the ziggurat, literally can embody the idea of one steps to heaven. So if we look at the door to the library of the School of Art, I'm not going to show you any since it was destroyed by fire, uh, because that's just too upsetting. The first fire was in 2014, but we've had another one since. In fact, in the very year that it was supposed to reopen to celebrate his centenary, 2018. Uh, but you can see here the library entrance uses the idea of a ziggurat. In fact, many of his entrances look more like the entrances to temples than to houses. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we'll end up at Derngate, 78 Derngate, his only major project south of the border in Northampton, where again you can see he's reprising the idea of the ziggurat and the, uh, the concept of steps to heaven. It also looks rather Chinese uh, because at the, uh, his design ethos was shifting at Derngate to what is almost Art Deco in terms of its preference for geometric forms and straight lines. So if we were able to go around the School of Art, we would have seen these uh, tile elements set into the walls. As you can see, this is all about the grid. And it was from Letherby that he got the idea of the square and the grid and four square. And this, of course, relates to the fact that there were four in the Glasgow Four, Macintosh and McNair, and then the two McDonald girls. And uh, the idea of Letherby's book was he went back to look at the roots of architecture. He studied temples, both in the new world and the old, and he maintained that you could distill architecture down into vital forms, one of them, of course, being the square and the other the circle. So here at last are the four. 
Uh, they obviously had intimations of their immortality as they actually christened themselves the immortals. So looking at the photograph at the top, uh, this is Frances MacDonald, her sister Margaret. This is Agnes Ray. Hang on, I've got to get that, go up one. Uh, this is Mark. So this is Catherine uh, Cameron and then Janet Aiken and then Agnes Rayburn and then Jessie Kepi, who again, a bit of an urban myth, were always told that this is the woman he should have married. And this is John Kepi, as in Honeyman and Kepi, uh, because Macintosh was art articled at a young age to an architectural of office, Honeyman and Kepi. So he and McNair, who we see in the front here, this is McNair, this is Macintosh, and we're, they're diabet diametrically opposed here on my side. So McNair and Macintosh were both articled at the same time to Honeyman and Kepi, and were having a formal training to become architects. Macintosh did not come from a particularly artistic background. Um, his father was in the police force, but really as a pen pusher. And so you have the usual descriptions of his childhood, you know, in the sense that he preferred to be out and about drawing uh, rather than in the classroom. But there's no, he's not, he's not from a major sort of artistic family. Uh, the two girls, Margaret and Frances, they were from a nice middle class background. They were attending the Glasgow School of Arts uh, during the day. So remembering that the two boys were going to evening classes to improve their uh, uh, prospects, they probably would not have met each other if they hadn't have been put together by Francis Newbury, who was the head of the Glasgow School of Art. Remembering that it's Women's International Women's Day, it is this big breakthrough in education. There's such a turning point for women at the end of the 1890s. And the Glasgow School of Art was particularly liberal uh, in its promotion of women taking up arts as a profession. So the School of Art was to become a, almost a, a manifesto for Macintosh's way of thinking. All the decoration on the building is meaningful. It's like a, a temple, really, to the production of art. When you look, walk along the front, you'll see these rather strange symbols. Uh, they are derived from Japanese heraldic devices. There's a bird, and oh, there's, hang on, there's a bat, and then there's a bee, and this is an ant, and the ants and all these animals are supposed to represent the idea of work, that you are an art worker. And they all have little uh, clumps of flowers, in case you're wondering what these are, around their bases. Because, of course, when you go into the School of Art, you grow as a person and as an artist. The windows of the School of Art, it's, it's a big studio building, they face north, they're very large. And these uh, strange elements here were braces, but also the window cleaner could put his uh, plank across uh, to keep the windows clean. As you can see, each brace is a little four square and a flower grows out of each one because you go into the School of Art, a little seed, and you come out a fully formed flower. Now, I know you think I've already been drinking gin, uh, but I promise you that this is the way that Macintosh thought. And it's really how most Art Nouveau architects thought. They wanted their patterns and their decoration to be meaningful. Here at the end of the so-called hen run, you can see that the grid actually dominates and even casts a shadow of the grid um, on the floor. So when we start to look at his uh, design for a very unusual poster, as you can see here, you can see all these elements coming together. Macintosh didn't differentiate between the high arts and the decorative arts. It was just art. Everything was to be a unity. Again, this was very much the way that all architects and designers thought at the end of the 19th century. So these are our strange Japanese heraldic devices. Here is our woman in the center to represent creativity. And the birds, of course, are to represent song because this is the Scottish Musical Review. And this is quite a radical design for a poster. And many people were quite affronted by the Glasgow style. So they nicknamed it the Spook School. People complained that they were too influenced by the disembodied figures of Aubrey Beardsley. So this is a close up of that cabinet that we saw at the beginning uh, with these elongated ladies. They're basically dresses and heads. Uh, the one over here was even more alarming in the sense that this is ionic symbolism. You might have heard of phallic symbolism, but ionic is probably new to you. It's the idea of using female genitalia for its symbolic power. 
Uh, so we have a woman here who is in the womb and she has like ear, well, they're like ears to either side or fallopian tubes uh, with the babies. And the idea here is that this is not just about motherhood, but about women as cre a creative life force in the world more generally. I should like to point out at this uh, moment that Margaret and Macintosh have no children of their own, which was not of their own making. And Francis and Herbert McNair, who married in 1899, only had one child. Macintosh's style is even more skeletal. This is a decoration of one of his uh, cabinets from the mid 1890s. And they were all thinking along very similar lines, as you can see from this book plate that's designed uh, with the two, by the two girls and Francis McNair. And in fact, Francis McNair's signature can be seen right down the bottom. But it seems to echo more overtly um, the motifs, in fact, of the two girls. Again, this could be seen as yonic symbolism. Uh, this is the one that's actually by Margaret uh, MacDonald, and you can see this synergy between all of their work. This is a stylized uh, tree of knowledge. These are apples, the children at the base of the tree. It's this idea really of creativity and motherhood and nurturing that they're trying to put over. And again, you remember that this is supposed to be uh, a book plate, an ex libris. So I've mentioned Beardsley a couple of times. It's just to remind you of his very distinctive black and white style. This is 1894 in date, and uh, the, uh, the project was Oscar Wilde's at Salome. We're looking here at John the Baptist and Salome, although you might not think that that's the way that many people would conceive at John the Baptist, just back from obviously Versace and suffering from a bad hair day. There were many people that felt that Beardsley's art was thoroughly subversive. Uh, but he was a huge influence on the Spook School. So here for comparison is a poster by Charles Rennie Mackintosh. You can see how he signed it vertically in the Japanese style. And again, this is one of those stylized uh, Japanese heraldic devices. That's Margaret uh, modeling for the Glasgow Institute of Fine Arts. And this is uh, same date, a poster by the three of them. So again, it's just to, to emphasize how very much this was seen to be a collaboration uh, between the four. So this is signed Francis, uh, Herbert and Margaret MacDonald. And again, you could read into this yonic symbolism, the idea again of creativity and fertility with the uh, goddess here protecting the maiden who represents regeneration and the life force. And these uh, posters went off to be shown in the famous Maison La Nouveau at Samuel Bing's prestigious art gallery, which opened in 1895 and gave the entire movement La Nouveau its name. So uh, for the uh, unsuspecting, uh, the work of the Glasgow girls can be rather shocking. So here, for instance, is The Pond by Francis. The idea is the pond has gone to sleep, it's November, and will reawaken in the spring. These are tadpoles, but we could read them as sperm if we wanted to. I'll show you why in just a minute. And on this side by Margaret, this is summer, which was a design for a stained glass window. Again, it's the idea of rejuvenation, which they loved. We're in the fin de siècle, remember? So we're imagining that the world, or I should say the century is dying and is about to be renewed. So they were bound to be influenced by the great symbolists of their generation. So I've mentioned Beardsley, this is Edvard Munch. His famous Madonna had already uh, created a sensation um, in Berlin. Um, it's uh, again an image of motherhood with a fetus down the bottom and little sperm swimming around the outside of the frame. Yes, as I said, the idea really was to the shock of the new in the 1890s. And next to it by Jan Turup, which who we know was a huge influence on the Glasgow girls. He's, by the way, a, a Dutch artist who was born in Java, but you can see here all these stylized roses, which will become one of the emblems of the Glasgow school. The three brides showed a nun, a good bride, a romantic bride in the center, and a witch at the end. Remember in the fin de siècle, women are either very good or very bad. So if I was going to pick out one element really to exemplify the Glasgow style, it would be the Glasgow rose and they all used it. So it's not a question of, of sort of picking out the girls and saying they had their own symbolic language. 
uh, the rose was used by them all. So this is Margaret's The Heart of the Rose, where the baby appears to be coming out of a womb. This is The Spirit of the Rose, same idea, but that's by Francis. And this down the bottom, designed for the Rose Boudoir in 1902, is Charles Henry Mackintosh, who also used the same stylized rose for the Willow Tea Rooms. And then finally down the bottom, as late as 1923, and therefore almost Art Deco in terms of its styling, we have a wallpaper rose and teardrop. So the rose was um, to represent again this idea of creativity, uh, was the heart of the rose, literally, was, was the womb. But the womb was this idea again that uh, you know, women are the life force uh, in nature. Mackintosh's early commissions are not that uh, groundbreaking. Uh, Queen's Cross Church, late, uh, as you can see, 1890s, shows an obvious debt to his uh, trip around England, visiting Porlock in Somerset and Devon. And then the Herald Building, now known as the Lighthouse, it's only when you get up very close to it and look at some of the detailing that you can see some Art Nouveau coming through. Uh, both of these commissions, of course, are when he is working for Honeyman and Kepi. And then he gets his first really big breakthrough uh, with Miss Cranston. She's quite a character, is Miss Cranston. Um, she has a long history of running tea shops in Glasgow before she decides to use uh, George Walton and Mackintosh to revamp her tea rooms to attract a new, more upmarket, more artistic clientele. The project was shared. Uh, so uh, the Buchanan Street Tea Room, Mackintosh provided a very strange and rather cerebral frieze of which you see one of the initial designs. Again, Margaret with a moon behind her appears to be uh, growing out of a rose bush. And then um, for the Argyle Street Tea Rooms, Mackintosh supplied the furniture, the famous Argyle Street chair and the domino table. And to show you how different George Walton's style was, that's George Walton's design uh, for the billiard room. And you can see that perhaps he's more influenced by the English arts and crafts movement in terms of his style. There's lots of hearts everywhere. So here is Miss Cranston, who, uh, even though she was a very modern woman, still appears to dress 40 years out of date um, in a very large uh, crinoline. Although she marries uh, John Cochrane, she never changes her name. She always remains Miss Cranston. Um, given the current climate this evening, this is rather amusing. Uh, you know, married women didn't have jobs in the 19th century. So it would have been very inappropriate for her to go by her married name. So she stuck to her maiden name, Miss Cranston. We know that Edwin Lutyens uh, went to have breakfast in the Buchanan Street Tea Room in 1898. He's our most important arts and crafts architect and his birth and death dates are almost identical to those of Mackintosh. He found the tea rooms just a little vulgar, a little outré. She would never commission an entire house for Mackintosh, but she did have her home, House Hill, Knits Hill, uh, remodelled. And so the chair at the top and the washstand and then the bedroom down below show you how immaculate the Mackintosh interior is. And by the way, the two pieces of furniture uh, well, the chair is now in the Met in New York. So I mentioned that rather strange uh, freeze that must have very much confused anybody who went uh, to uh, Buchanan Street for a cup of tea and sat on a George Walton chair. Um, it's a sequence of these stylized ladies in sort of rose trees with a tree of knowledge in the center. It clearly has some depth to sort of Egyptian art, but the theme of the rose was actually quite obvious was a reference to tea, to the Chinese tea rose. Uh, so perhaps it's not quite as obtuse as you uh, thought it was at the beginning. And it was based on an, an earlier work called, called Part Seen, Part Imagined, which again reminds you that Mackintosh deliberately goes out of his way to create works which are elusive and um, quite troublesome in terms of working out what his message was. But I think essentially here we're in a hortus conclusus, or what's called a rus in urbis, a city, a garden in the city with these stylized rose trees. The roses, of course, are direct reference to tea. In the center, you have a tree of knowledge or a tree of life 
So you're in a sort of Elysium fields or paradise while drinking your tea. So his first important commissions are from Miss Cranston, but in terms of his breakthrough for architecture, it's a winning the commission to build the Glasgow School of Art. And Francis Newbury was definitely behind that. Here's the full, full building as it looked when it was finished in 1909. Initially, they could only build half of it up to about there before the money uh, ran out. So it's quite useful in the sense that the early part of the building, it represents Macintosh's early style. And this side here, the later part of the building, which includes the library, uh, represents his mature style. So there's obviously some references to uh, Scottish architecture, the sort of baronial castles of the north. So I'm showing you Craigie Var over here with the daffodils in front. And you can see here a parapet and a turret. So there's clear references as Letherby advised to look at one's native vernacular forms, building in local materials and using local styles. If we have a closer look at the main entrance, there's this very strange light fitting, this lamp here, which takes us up to the door with its two rather beautiful stylized ladies over the portal. It's like entering a temple. And again, they represent the theme of creativity. They are holding plants or even flowers in their hands. And there's a stylized rose tree in the center with a very large bulb or root at the base. So you go into this temple of art as a sort of fledgling and you come out fully formed. And the tree was a very, again, potent symbol for Glasgow and Mackintosh because it's one of the emblems of St Mungo, the bird and the tree of St Mungo, the patron saint of the city. Coming back down to the door, the other interesting thing to look at is the calligraphy. So you can see the very unusual way uh, that he uh, draws a letter A and a letter H with three bars. It clearly has a mystical significance as it's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And then the plaque with the, uh, you know, the, the, the number for the Glasgow School, the address on it here, we have four squares by four squares. Uh, and so they loved the, uh, this idea again of numeric symbolism. The heart of the building was the museum uh, where they drew from plaster casts. And you can see here that he's actually carved hearts um, into the roof structure, again, to emphasize the sort of communal hearts of the building. So all the decoration uh, is, is meaningful. And if we go to the other end of the building, remember this is his uh, tour de force. It includes the library. You might think now that he might, in 1906, 1909, have met Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, he really only knew about the work of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright came to Europe in 1910. But there are some very obvious similarities. The curves have gone. We now have, a, well, it's still rather fortress-like wall, but with these amazing uh, cantilevered windows uh, going the full height. The downside of that was, of course, that they acted like flues. I mean, the original fire of 2014. And I'm not going to dwell really on the interior because obviously it is lost, but here it is. And for many people, this is Macintosh's masterpiece. Uh, he designed everything, uh, not necessarily all the chairs that you're seeing here, but originally all the furniture, the whole thing uh, was conceived as Gesamte Kunstwerk. And the space is very compact uh, with this gallery and what looked like abacuses, I've always uh, thought, uh, running down below. You can get a, an idea at least of what it would have looked like uh, from his uh, original conception for the Oak Room at the Ingram Street Tea Room. This just predated the library at the School of Art. And you can see him working through his ideas for this uh, galleried level. So this is now in the new b and in Dundee. Um, it was rescued, but then put into store. They didn't have any room for it at Kelvin Grove, that's the art gallery in the center of Glasgow. But now it's become one of the centerpieces at the v &A Dundee. And with the loss of the School of Art, this is some uh, minor compensation. However, I think that his real masterpieces are his interiors, his domestic interiors, which are absolutely exquisite. Now, every time I look at them, I just wonder how an ordinary mortal lived in them. Now, admittedly, this photograph of Main Street, their flats in the centre of Glasgow, was designed as an advertorial, but nevertheless, you can see that there's no clutter 
you can't imagine children in it at all, can you? So we saw the cabinet earlier. Here is the table uh, with this uh, stylized tree in it. And the uh, top chair over here was originally conceived for the Argyle Street tea rooms. So he would make, um, he would make replicas of his designs for his own use. But it is the Macintosh house that's really come to exemplify his domestic style. Now this is at Hillhead, which is just sort of, you know, near the university. It's a suburb of Glasgow. They move out there to get uh, better air. And uh, he, ha he, can't build his own, he, ha he can't build his own house. It's a rented property, so he has to adapt it. So you can see here he was limited but with what he could do. But he removed this intervening wall, uh, made a uh, free-flowing open space. This is the uh, drawing room area. This is a sort of library study area. Uh, the chair here was made for Margaret. It's got stylized trees on it. And we have two cushions down here, uh, allegedly for their cats, which were artfully arranged, clearly. On the mantelpiece, you can see two Japanese prints. To just to remind you all the time, that this uh, vision of minimalism and relative austerity, um, you know, it's, it's very Spartan compared to some of the contemporary Victorian interiors, is all to do with this Japanese ethos. And the two cabinets that you can see here, they're just tucked away, they're closed here in my photograph. Now I'm opening them, opening them. This original one is, believe it or not, in Canada, in Toronto. But you can see here his love also of blue and white china. That's another thing that he collected. It's another kimono cabinet, but here a stylized woman holding a rose. And this is designed by Macintosh, not Margaret. If we look at some of his uh, contemporaries, we can see where he was uh, deriving some of his ideas. I've mentioned William Letherby, who's part of the arts and crafts movement. This is CFA Voisey, who's often described as England at uh, Macintosh. And I couldn't resist obviously putting this in, as it's in Chorley Wood. Though I have never managed to get into the orchard, perhaps you might know somebody who will be kind enough to give you an, an escorted tour. You can see that just like Macintosh, uh, Voisey was a minimalist, and everything is beautifully placed in his Gesamtkunstwerk. I can show you what it might have looked like in terms of its colour. He didn't really go in for a lot of pattern, though he was a major designer of wallpapers and textiles, there was a little bit of pattern, as you can see in the famous rug on the floor here. We know that the walls were purple and uh, green and uh, turkey red uh, curtains to give you some idea that it was very much a, a symphony or a harmony of colours. And you might just pick out here this chair in the corner that it's very high back because they were all very keen on high back chairs. So this was actually made as a wedding gift. It was commissioned by a newly married couple. So the two hearts in the back are to represent their union, but also this is Voice's logo. East is west, home is best, and home is where the heart is. The important thing is that they all make tall back chairs. So does Frank Lloyd Wright. So here we are. Remember that they don't really know each other until after 1909. Uh, so here is the Ward Willits house, one of the prairie houses, 1901 to 1903. You can see that really, in terms of his sympathies, Frank Lloyd Wright's lean much more towards the English arts and crafts movement. The furniture is really solid. You can have some Vikings to dinner, couldn't you, on those chairs. By comparison, the Macintosh interior is much more feminine, much more um, really um, ephemeral, but also fragile looking at the chairs. Uh, and here, the beautiful stencil decoration of the trellis with weeping roses and honesty. So it's much more feminine, I think, all round uh, compared to the English arts and crafts movement and, uh, Mac and uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in particular. So here we are in the bedroom of the Macintosh house. So it was pulled down, but they sort of built a shell with the, in the Hunterian to mock up the original interiors. So the stencil patterns here on the textiles are courtesy of Margaret. What I want to, you to draw attention to is the mirror, like a sled on end, because this is uh, one of the exhibits taken to Vienna in 1900. So Macintosh did not participate in Paris 1900. Instead, he was one of the stars of the 8th Vienna Secession exhibition held in November, December of 1900. 
we've got lots of photographs of it so we know exactly what was taken. So here in Gesu, this type of fine plaster work, which is then um, decorated with semi-precious stones, shells and other, again, rather ephemeral, ephemeral um, elements. This is Margaret's contribution, as are the banners. This is the Argyle Street chair. That's, there's the mirror that we've just been looking at and a clock in the corner, which was also a, actually probably a joint project between Francis and Margaret MacDonald. They're just about to marry their respective uh, spouses. So here are the banners that have been reconstructed. And again, you can perhaps see the all seeing eyes give them an Egyptian flavor, but they are very much influenced by Beardsley. The exhibition took place in this building, which if you've been to Vienna, you'll be very familiar with. It declared over its golden dome made out of laurels to every art its age and to art its freedom. And Macintosh was seen to be something of a prophet of a new style. Here's another of the rooms. We know, by the way, that um, you know Macintosh was wooed. They they went to see him. Uh, the sort of committee went to see him um, in Glasgow to invite him to show um, at the eighth secession exhibition um, held in November December. Uh, so he was very much seen to be at the forefront, the cutting edge of modern design. So the cabinet we know here was bought by one of the patrons of the Vienna Secession. You'll see his own in a minute, Hugo Henberg. This is um, the panel that we saw over the fireplace um, in the Macintosh house, but it was originally conceived as a fire screen, as you can see down the bottom. But things keep popping up. We think things are lost, but only recently these went through an auction house in Vienna and they are the panels on the front of this type of cabinet and they represent night and day. There you can see it in the photograph. So this is the home of uh, Hugo Henberg and the architect of this is not Macintosh, though you might be forgiven for thinking that it was. With its reliance on the grid, its cool Japanese minimalism, it's definitely been influenced by Macintosh. But the architect of this is the Viennese architect, Josef Hoffmann. In the centre of it, taking pride and place, is a magnificent portrait by Gustav Klimt. So again, this makes you think about how uh, Klimt's works would have looked in these uber-progressive uh, Viennese secession interiors. She's wearing a fantastic dress, as you can see, designed uh, by Emily uh, Floger. The next landmark in Macintosh's career was Turin 1902, which I always think is the high point, really, of Art Nouveau, Jugendstil and Secession. Macintosh was given a free hand uh, for the Scottish section. But the real star, I have to say, of Turin 1902, as far as the Italians were concerned, uh, was the furniture of Carlo Bugatti, which I'm showing you at the top. But he too, this is Carlo Bugatti, was hugely influenced uh, by Japanese and Oriental art. So you have to be very, um, well, Art Nouveau Jugendstil, that's the German term, and uh, secession style in Vienna, liberty style in Italy. It may be short-lived, it may, um, you know, have a, um, a, you know, what appears to be a short life, but it's very widespread. You can often, well, we do describe Art Nouveau as a pan-world style. Margaret and uh, Charles Macintosh, now married, collaborated on the Rose Boudoir. Here it is, we know it from contemporary illustrations. Elements of this have survived or been reconstructed. So this is a Dieu, you can see it on the wall there in the background. And this is the magnificent uh, Gesu panel over the fireplace of the uh, pink and the white rose. Uh, rather amusingly, this went through Christie's about 10, 15 years ago with an estimate of 200 to 400,000. It made 1.4 million, which perhaps again gives you an idea of the reputations that have been turned around, not just Macintosh, but also Margaret. And so here back in the Macintosh house in Glasgow, uh, reconstructed, we have the beautifully stenciled decoration here on the backs of the chair. This is also stenciled, but now on silk. And the problem with these chairs is they are so um, top heavy that you can't really move them away from the wall. So practicality was never a major issue. You actually see it here. 
against the wall of Fritz Warndorfer's music room, which was a commission that came out of Turin 1902. The table here has survived and again, not exactly arts and crafts functionality as it's got eight legs. As you can see, it looks almost like something um, anthropomorphic. But most importantly, it was the amazing frieze uh, designed by Margaret MacDonald Mackintosh of the uh, seven princesses that was going to dominate the room. Here's the space ready for it to be inserted, but it was not completed until 1907. It's massive. It now lives in the Mac uh, in Vienna. The theme uh, from a symbolist story uh, by Metalink is the seven princesses. It's very sad. The knight has gone off to do what knights do, uh, do or die, but in the interval, his beautiful princess has pined and died. Yes, I'm sorry. Here are some close-ups just to show you how the, you know, this is an amazing technique that the two girls, but particularly Margaret, uh, becomes famous for. So it's plaster and string, semi-precious stones. Uh, you know, it's, it's encrusted uh, like uh, jewel work. And it was Margaret that really made uh, Gesu work or Jesu work her forte. Now, Mar uh, Margaret and Mackintosh would have taken back a lot from their visit to Vienna and then Turin in 1902. You can see his design ethos shifting away from those sort of very feminine, uh, pink, purpley, uh, silver interiors towards something closer, in fact, to the Vienna secession style that we associate with the Wiener Werkstatter which was founded in 1903. So here from the Willow Tea Room, um, it's actually a chair come divider, and the famous Sitzen machine, uh, designed by Josef Hoffmann, which looks bloody uncomfortable, doesn't it, without its cushions, that was designed around 1905. So back in uh, Glasgow, we now his, have his mature style and his most famous commissions. For the Willow Tea Rooms for Miss Cranston, he was allowed to design the entire project, it's known as the Willow Tea Rooms because that's what Socky Hall means, Grove of Willows. And inside, it's composed out of split spaces. So this is looking up towards the mezzanine. This is looking towards the uh, sort of breakfast dining area at the front. There was a sort of a darker dining area um, at the back. Uh, the plaster friezes are to represent stylized trees uh, in the Willow Wood. And of course, this has had a huge amount of money spent on it very recently to bring it to bring back its former glory. So you can see here the plaster panels of the willow trees on the walls and all of the uh, fabrics, applique work, would again be down to Margaret in terms of fabrication, possibly even designing. So here we are on the Metzini. You can see here an interesting use again of uh, Japanese uh, design features the roof in particular. And that takes us into the so-called Room Deluxe, where originally there was a large Jesu panel by uh, Margaret uh, entitled, Oh Ye, All Ye, That Walk in the Willow Wood, which is a poem of, uh, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Again, this is to really emphasize that his interiors are never really practical. Uh, beautiful mirrored glass, exquisite colors, purples and pinks, but really aluminium painted chairs um, this is all about the look rather than the practicality. His most spectacular piece of, but is it stained glass? It's more like Tiffany glass. I prefer to call this leaded glass uh, for obvious reasons, both the frieze and the door itself, which you can see here in situ, but the original is now so, so valuable, it's displayed as a work of art in its own right. So here is the Hill House, 1902 for the publisher Walter Blackie. You can see it's dominated by the same, I'm going to call it femininity, in terms of its colours, the pinks, the silvers and the purples. We know that Margaret designed the antimacassars and we're looking here at the winter section. So this is cosy round the fire. Over the fire, again in Jesu, was another lovely panel by Margaret of the Sleeping Beauty. Hence again, or the Sleeping Princess, hence all of those roses. Remember the original story. Uh, she is enchanted in a briar rose. The conservatory element here was the summer area. You can see again now restored uh, by the National Trust uh, that Margaret would have been very much responsible for all the soft furnishings. And then in the corner there's a place 
for a piano. So Macintosh doesn't really think vertically, he thinks horizontally. And he's thought about the functionality of the room with a summer area, a winter area, and an area for music with the piano. Here's a better view of the summer area. And if you go in high summer and you're lucky enough for the sun to come out, you'll see that this almost acts like a sundial. And the grid literally passes uh, through the ta table, creating a silhouette as the sun crosses the sky. Nice bit of symbolism. So it's very ergonomic, this house. It was designed uh, for Walter Blackie as a home, but also a place of work. So when you come in the front door, Blackie's office is immediately to the left-hand side. So that's as far as any tradesperson would go. And then you would go into the private sanctum. Again, this emphasizes that he thinks horizontally as the staircase is tucked away here. He doesn't make anything of the height that he could have used. Uh, with, you know, opening the space up uh, to show a sort of like three-dimensional fluid space uh, with the staircase included. It's very Japanese, as you can see from the light fittings and the clock on the wall. So we could compare it to one of Horta's most impressive interiors. Um, his own uh, house and studio, uh, the Musée Horta, uh, begun in 1899, where the, ex it's the exact opposite. The staircase is the main feature of the entire interior. Um, it's like a giant spiral. It's uh, a plant uh, straining towards the light, which is the famous fan light at the top. And the uh, levels uh, come off it like, like, different, like different mezzanines almost, but there's a level for the dining room, a level for the drawing room salon, so it's, it is literally like an organic building, like a tree with the branches spinning off to form the different floor levels. So Frank Lloyd Wright, again, influenced by Japan, thinks much more like Macintosh. So I'm showing you here his masterpiece, his most famous uh, prairie house, uh, the Ro Robbie House in Chicago, part of the university campus now. It's what one long continuous space with a giant fireplace in the middle, dividing the sitting area up from the dining area. And here's the dining area down the bottom. And I do love those built-in lamps. Back in Macintosh's Hill House, you can see here again this lateral thinking. You have an alcove for the bed. You have then a dressing area with the two wardrobes. And this is the little washstand in the corner. And behind me, we have a sort of ingle nook uh, retreat, a sort of little place to gain you could get cozy in the winter. Um, this is the chair. Again, it's not really practical. It's more like a sculpture in the form of a chair. You might put your clothes on it, uh, but it would be very difficult to sit on. But it has that signature. So it has that signature grid uh, right at the top. And then uh, if we could swing around and look the other way, here's this uh, nice little ingle nook uh, around the fireplace. So he has open plan, but he has very clearly designated functions. So the bed area, the sleeping, the dressing area where the wardrobes are with their stylized roses, and then this little ingle nook uh, fireplace in the corner. Oops. So this is what it looks like from the outside. You can now see where the uh, staircase is. The whole lot is underneath this amazing work of art in its own right, this cover, as they try to work out uh, how to uh, preserve the rough cast. I particularly wanted to show you the front of the building. Um, as when I said it was ergonomic, that's the principal bedroom over here, and that's the children's nursery. You couldn't get any further if you tried. And underneath the principal bedroom is uh, Blackie's office. So functionality was very important for Mac and Josh. Just to show you how radical his style is, I want to very quickly show you Blackwell, a beautiful house by Mackay Hugh Bailey Scott on Lake Windermere, but you can see it looks like a giant medieval manor house. And inside, yes, it does have a, a rather beautiful white room, but the plaster decoration seems to hark back to the Jacobean era, though I do love the Inglenook fireplace. This dates to 1898, so it predates, in fact, uh, the work that we're looking at by Macintosh. Uh, the rug on the floor is by Voisier, if I, if I remember correctly. And here's the entrance, which is what we call Tudor Beethan in the trade. Lots of half timbering, 
giant inglenook fireplaces there's also a sort of solar up here a place for the ladies to look down on the gentlemen who have cut, just come back in from hunting shooting and fishing but mackintosh is very clever in getting rid of all of these historical elements he sort of completely wipes out the sort of cheetah beef and element that you're looking at here in this uh, portfolio drawing for a house for an art lover when Bailey Scott and Mackintosh were in direct competition with each other in 1901. They submitted this portfolio for a house for an art lover to a competition in Darmstadt. Bailey Scott technically wins, but Mackintosh's house has become much more famous. Here is the design for the music room. And this is what it looks like built. Of course, it was never built in Macintosh's day. It's a perfect example of Mockintosh, uh, but it has been mocked up superbly. Here over the entrance, well, the garden side, it are our stylized ladies and trees of life. And then inside, it's, off, it's used for weddings now. It's currently owned by the University of uh, Glasgow. It's part of the Glasgow School of Art, I should say. So we're looking here towards uh, the far end where the fireplace is and the little built-in cabinets. And then flipping round, we'll show you the ends uh, with the organ. So it's, you can imagine how people want to get married there. Uh, and again, it's like Hill House. It's all sort of lovely pastel shades, pinks and purples. The dining room is darker in all of these Victorian houses or in this case, a Wardian house. Uh, interior, the male area, the dining room is always darker. The female drawing room is always lighter. And uh, they've gone to great pains here in the reconstruction, or I should say the sort of um, mocking tosh element. These rather beautiful uh, panels, again, uh, in the style of Margaret. And they run, as you can see, in the panelling around the wall. So by this stage, Macintosh's career is going absolutely nowhere. It's as though he's already, I'm afraid, out of favour uh, with uh, his contemporary patrons. He has one last uh, major public commission. Um, he's now um, a partner in Honeyman and Kepi. So this is between 1904 and 1906 and is the Scotland Street School, uh, a tree of life again, being an obvious decorative element. He also gets uh, a tea room commission from Miss Cranston, a refit, Ingram Street in 1911, where with the barrel chair and the interior and that chair at the top, you can particularly see the interest in the influence of China rather than Japan. And he uh, submits a design for the cathedral in Liverpool. So imagine what Liverpool would be like with a Macintosh cathedral and how many tourists they would get. It's uh, Giles Gilbert Scott that gets the commission, but this is more salt in Mackintosh's wound. In this portrait here, he's showing in his hand the design for the School of Art. So by 1914, Mackintosh, his hopes are dashed. He might have taken up drink, we're not sure, but in order to recover his health, it is suggested that Margaret and Mackintosh go to Warberswick on the Suffolk coast. Um, it's during this uh, troubled year that he paints many of his beautiful uh, watercolours of flowers, as you can see here, many of these are dated 1914, but they don't have a, a good or easy time of it. The locals don't appreciate his Glaswegian accent, and they also are very perturbed by all of the letters uh, coming from Germany, all of his Austrian friends, and he's arrested as a spy. Um, fortunately, nothing comes of that, uh, but I think they exit pretty quickly uh, to Chelsea. So his last project from his Chelsea years is 78 Derngate uh, for Basic Loke, who does not make toys. I should point that out straight away. Um, he made some models and was very successful. He was very progressive. He was a member of the Design and Industries Association, and he wanted a very modern house. However, we are now in the war years. He didn't want to be too ostentatious. Uh, uh, Derngate is in effect a, a wedding present. And it's this little tiny house that you see here in this terrace in Northampton. And the door is a reproduction. I'm going to show you the original. Hang on, I'll right, welcome. Here it is, the original, which is now part of the museum exhibit. Yes, the, the lamp and the stained glass and the knocker are too valuable to be left out of doors. 
importantly, it's the ziggurat motif that we are looking for throughout the house, over the doorway and very obviously around the fireplace. And this is reprising uh, the ziggurat element around the School of Art library door, Our Steps to Heaven. But rather amusingly on the mantelpiece is George Bernard Shaw, who came to stay. And I'm showing you as it looks today, it's been beautifully reconstructed. You can see what a tiny space it is. Macintosh designed a lot of furniture for it using the latest ideas. In particular, the smoker's cabinet uses aeronoid, an early type of plastic. Mrs. Bassett Lowe really did not like the colour scheme. It was too dark and it was changed to this. Though I think you'll agree, it's equally bold in its use of colour. And here is the smoker's cabinet. And here is the famous clock designed for Derngate, which I think you would very likely describe as Art Deco. Looking the other way, the screen separates the very tiny drawing room from the staircase. We have a truly awesome light fitting, as you can see, and we're going straight up to the guest bedroom, where Mrs. Bassett Lope was very worried that George Bernard Shaw would have difficulty sleeping, but he reassured her that he always slept with his eyes shut. So hopefully those uh, psychedelic black and white lines were not to prove too difficult for him. Uh, the domino clock was probably made for this room and was one of Macintosh's last designs. We're, we're back where we uh, started with the domino table uh, for Argyle Street. It's a very clever design with each one of the numerals, as you can see, a domino. Right, last couple of slides. We are now uh, in Chelsea. He has lots of ideas, but very few of his ideas have come to fruition for blocks of flats. He designs one last element for Miss Cranston, again in Derngate style, very bold colours, known as the dugout, that's 1917. And on Glebe Place, his last architectural project, this very modest house, which has been much altered over the years. Uh, they, the owners have given themselves, as you can see, a Macintosh doorway. And they made their money, that's Margaret and uh, Charles and Macintosh, largely through designs for wallpapers and textiles. But then Margaret gets a small inheritance and they decide to give up. And in 1923, they move to France. When Bassett Loke looks around, therefore, for an architect for his, for his new home, what will become uh, uh, New Ways, the first modernist house in, Europe, uh, in Britain, um, I'm afraid Mackintosh has already left. And so he doesn't get what might have been a sort of swan song uh, for him. He's already um, in Port Vange and Couleur painting these rather beautiful architectural uh, watercolours. So it's Peter Behrens that gets the commission to build new ways for Bassett Loke in 1926. Sadly, his health uh, it deteriorates and we know that he develops a cancer of the throat, uh, largely from smoking. And uh, he will return uh, to England to die and Margaret will follow him just a few years later. But he's a very important figure in the evolution of European architecture and design, particularly through that visit to Vienna in 1900. Many feel that without Mackintosh, we wouldn't have had this building, which dates in fact to 1904 to 1907, and again described as the first modernist building in Europe. This is Otto Wagner's masterpiece, the Postal Savings Bank, and you can see here the sort of minimalism and geometric language that we've come to associate with Macintosh. And if we hadn't have had the Vienna Secession, Josef Hoffmann, Colum and Moser, and the Wiener Werkstätte, we probably wouldn't have had the Bauhaus, exemplified here by the Wassily Kandinsky chair and the Miss van der Rohe Barcelona chair. So you could argue that Macintosh has become one of the titans in the emergence of modernism on the eve of the 20th century. So if uh, you like my uh, style and you like my subjects, you only need to go to my uh, web pages and type an anderson.com uh, where I offer lectures, which you can pay for. I also have a very good uh, YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, here coming up. As you can see, uh, you don't need to worry about the ULR. You just need to type in um, Anne Anderson Art and Design History Channel and you'll get some free previous lectures to look at. 
and inevitably I couldn't resist giving you uh, an advert for my book on Art Nouveau architecture that came out at the end of 2020. Thank you very much for your time. If you do want to say to know more about me or my lectures, which I'm pleased to say have been very successful, uh, you will find them at anne-anderson.com. Thank you very much for your time.